This is the seventh in a series of eight uh, doctrinal studies on the uh, person and ministry of Satan. At the end of the last tape, we were discussing the passage there in Ephesians chapter 6, and I said I wanted to go back and comment on that. Notice in verse 12, we have our enemy here. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And uh, then there are various titles mentioned here. We wrestle against principalities. And some feel this is a possible reference to Satan's generals, the five-star generals, who have the oversight of entire nations, like in Daniel chapter 10. So here we have the uh, principalities, and then the Bible says we wrestle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities. Secondly, against powers. Now, if the principalities stand for the five-star generals, maybe the powers speak of his private soldiers. And then world rulers, uh, res uh, the uh, wrestling against principalities, against powers, thirdly, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, world rulers. And these demons may be the ones in charge of Satan's worldly business. And then fourthly, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And these, this may be a reference to those demons in charge of worldly religion. But at any rate, uh, these are the enemies along with Satan that the believer faces and that he uh, must have the proper protection when Satan attacks. Notice his tactics now. Paul speaks of the wiles of the devil. Uh, my Greek teacher, Dr. Kenneth Weiss, once wrote these words. He said, the word wiles is methodia in the Greek, M-E-T-H-O-D-E-I-A, referring to a cunning art, deceit, craft or trickery. It means to follow up or investigate by method and subtle plan to follow craftily framed devices and to deceive. That's what it speaks of the wiles of the devil. And then also he speaks of the fiery darts of the wicked in verse 16, that we might be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And Dr. Wee says that this is a reference to the arrows tipped with tow or pitch or such material then set on fire before they were discharged. So this is the enemy we fight and these are his that we face and these are the, his tactics. Now uh, let's notice his equipment. Uh, that is to say, our equipment, the armor of God. Let's carefully note each piece of armor mentioned here. And let me read these verses, Ephesians 6, verse 13 to 17. Uh, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, Paul very obviously takes those pieces of armor worn by the Roman soldier of the day, and he makes a spiritual application to each one of them. Let's notice them one at a time now, one by one, the girdle of truth. Um, Exposer's commentary says the following about this. First in the list of these articles of equipment mentioned by Paul is the girdle. Appropriately so. For the soldier might be furnished with every other part of his equipment, and yet wanting his girdle would neither be fully clothed nor securely armed. His belt was no mere adornment of the soldier, but an essential part of his equipment. Passing round the loins and by the end of the breastplate, in latter times supporting the sword, it was a special use in keeping other parts in place 
and in securing the proper soldierly attitude and freedom of movement. Truth, as mentioned here, because Paul here speaks of the loins girt about with the truth, truth, as mentioned here, probably refers to truthfulness as found in a Christian. Thus, a believer whose life is tainted with deceit and falsehood forfeits the very thing which holds other pieces of his armor together. Now, that's really a significant truth brought out there. And then the second piece of armament that the Christian is to wear in proper protection when Satan attacks is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I think this speaks of the right acts as practiced by the believer. The breastplate was to protect the heart of the soldier, and thus unrighteous acts committed by a Christian robs him of this vital protection and exposes his spiritual heart to Satan. The Bible says that if our hearts condemn us not, then we have uh, confidence with God and towards God. But what if our hearts do condemn us? because of the lack of righteous acts in our life as a believer. And I'm speaking of a believer now. That's the breastplate of righteousness. Thirdly, now, it speaks of the sandals of the gospel. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The Roman soldier wore sandals, which were bound by thongs over the instep, and around the ankle, and the soles were thickly studded with nails. And this, of course, gave him a firm footing in time of attack. And this may refer, we're not sure, but it may refer to the assurance and confidence which comes from knowing the great doctrinal truths associated with the gospel, the sandals of the gospel. And then the fourth piece of armor that he was to wear is the shield of faith. Again, Dr. Kenneth Weiss writes the following words. He says, The word shield used here designated the shield of the heavy infantry, a long, oblong one, four by two and one-half feet, sometimes curved on the inner side. Hebrews 11 is a commentary on this piece of armor, the shield of faith. And then the fifth Armament piece is the helmet of salvation. The helmet, of course, would protect the head and the brain. And this piece, perhaps like the sandals, may refer to the intake of Bible doctrine. Lest one's eyes be blinded, his ears deafened, and his mind confused with the attacks from the world, the flesh, and the devil. The helmet of salvation. We don't have that on now. Uh, doctrinal intake, then we uh, do not hear the things that we should hear. We do not see the things that we should see from the Word of God. And uh, we allow our mind to become confused with our enemy, by our enemy. And then the final piece of armament here is actually uh, in a weapon in itself. It speaks of the sword of the Spirit. Above all, Paul says, taking uh, the uh, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is the only offensive weapon mentioned in these various pieces of armor. Of course, the rest are defensive in nature, but here is an offensive weapon. And the sword of the Spirit we know because it's identified to be the Word of God. And this, then, is the armor that the Christian is commanded to wear in order to have on the proper protection when Satan does attack, and he will attack. All right, um, uh, one final comment from Dr. Weiss here. He says the word take unto you is uh, ana lambano in the Greek, and it's in the aorist imperative. It literally means to take up in order to use. And uh, because it is the aorist imperative, uh, it uh, refers to a command given with military snap and courteousness, a command to, obeyed, to be obeyed at once and once for all. Thus, Mr. Weiss says, the Christian is to take up and put on all the armor of God as a once-for-all act 
and keep that armor on during the entire course of his life, not relaxing the discipline necessary for the constant use of such protection. He says, finally, the historian Gibbon relates how the relaxation of discipline and disuse of exercise rendered the Roman soldiers less willing and less able to support the fatigue of service. They complained of the weight of armor and obtained permission to lay aside much of it. And later on, the Roman armies would be defeated on the fields of battle. And then finally here, Paul says, having done all to stand. Now, three things were told in the remaining verses of Ephesians 6. We're to stand. Uh, in fact, he says this four times in verses 11, 13, 14, and 16. We're to stand, and we are to pray, and we are to watch. These three things, uh, in addition to the proper protection uh, that Paul tells us here in Ephesians 6, uh, will guarantee victory over Satan. Dr. J. McGee says concerning stand here, he says, Thus, when tempted to do wrong, we should flee, as did Joseph in Genesis 39. Remember, Potiphar's wife wanted him to uh, commit adultery with her. We should flee when tempted to do wrong. But when attacked by Satan for doing right, we should stand firm as, da as did Daniel's three friends in Daniel chapter 3. See, they stood firm. McGee says, It has been observed that as pilgrims we walk, as witnesses we talk, as contenders we run, but as fighters we stand. So here you have now, we must have on the proper protection when Satan attacks. All right, now, the third thing that we've discussed here, Satan cannot stand the blood of Christ. We said three things he uh, cannot do. He cannot tempt a believer except by God's permission. He cannot stand to be resisted, and he cannot tolerate or stand the blood of Christ. Someone comes to your door, or uh, you have a discussion with a, a stranger, uh, any place actually, on religion, and you'd like to know, he claims to be a Christian perhaps, and you'd like to know just how fundamental and how conservative he might be. And then the acid test is the question about the blood. Now don't ask him what he thinks about Jesus. That's important, but the liberals, you see, have so just... Uh, malign that word and confuse the issue that uh, uh, you might ask a person, uh, do you believe in the, in the uh, deity of Christ? Do you believe in the divinity of Christ? And he might not, but he would say he did in a sense that, yes, we're all sons of God. So that's not the acid test. And you might say, well, what, do you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead? And he might say, yes, but he would not be speaking of a bodily resurrection. He would be thinking of that spiritual resurrection where, you know, every spring the birds come back from their uh, winter retreat and the little flowers begin to push themselves up through the ground and all nature is resurrected. Yes, I believe in the resurrection of Christ, but it wouldn't be the way you would mean it, you see. And you wouldn't necessarily ask him, do you believe the Bible is inspired by God? Because uh, here some liberals believe that insofar as it is accurate, the Bible is inspired by God. See, they double talk. But if you want to get right down to the nitty-gritty and cut out all the uh, nonsense and, and uh, here's the bottom line and trying to check out a person theologically, Sir, I would like to know, we don't have a lot of time to discuss theology, what do you think about the blood of Christ? And I'll guarantee you that'll separate, spiritually speaking, the boys from the men and the ladies from the girls. Right away, if the person's unsaved or if the person's not in the right relationship to God or has, is controlling, if he's controlled by the devil, immediately uh, you'll be able to determine his spirituality or a lack of spirituality. 
You see, you can uh, stand back, as I used to in a uh, factory, and uh, I would see this piece of steel, and there was some pieces of steel as it came out of the mill there that was uh, extremely hot, and other pieces that were not. And sometimes they were all mingled in, and you didn't know what piece was hot and what piece was not hot. It had been there for a while to cool off. And so after getting burned four or five times and, and wasting time uh, cautiously approaching this piece of steel and wondering if it was hot, because sometimes it wouldn't even radiate a lot of heat till you just put your hand on it and then immediately it'd grab you and sting like a serpent almost. Uh, I uh, would carry a... I had a little water pistol with me, and I'd just squirt that water pistol on a piece of steel, and right away it would tell me if it hissed and steamed and sort of shot back uh, uh, the water at me, I knew right away that I had no business touching that piece of steel. So uh, the, uh, the, the squirt gun you can use right away to detect any heat of Satan in the life of a person, another person, is to ask the question, what do you think about the blood of Jesus? Satan cannot stand the blood of Christ. Revelation 12, verse 11, uh, emphasizes this truth. And they, the saints in heaven, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. And as we have suggested in the notes, uh, we can rest assured that songs like Power in the Blood and Nothing But the Blood will never be put on the top ten of the Hades hit parade. Oh, this is a wonderful way to defeat the devil or to counteract the attacks of the devil is to begin singing hymns dealing with the blood. Uh, I often carry a hymnal with me on business trips in my briefcase along with my toothpaste and my uh, various other personal articles and shirts and ties and my Bible, I carry a hymn book. And some of the most blessed times that I've ever had dealing with the Lord in prayer is by opening the hymnal and singing in my cracked voice these songs of praise dealing with the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus, just singing these, because Satan cannot stand the blood of Christ. All right, now, finally, the strength of Satan. We've uh, noticed what he cannot stand. We've noticed his weaknesses. We've noticed uh, other things about him. Now, the strengths of Satan. And in your notes, we have what we entitled... The 16 deadly D's of the devil. You may add a few more of these D's in your own mind, but I have attempted to uh, glean out from the dictionary 16 words and taken some of these actual words from the Bible that I feel are the strong points in Satan. That is to say, uh, uh, sometimes the way that Satan works in tempting the believer. Number one disappointment. To be disappointed is to forget Romans 8.28. Oh, how many Christians are defeated by the devil because they are not aware that all disappointment comes from the devil. Paul says, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, it does not say here that all things are good. If a man has his heart set on a job, and it's a good job, and it's a job with a lot of uh, potential in the future, a, it has a, a wonderful salary attached to it, it's a job he thinks he could enjoy, and he doesn't get that job. It's just natural, humanly speaking, to be disappointed. What I'm saying that the devil can and often does use that disappointment and causes the believer to lose all fellowship uh, that he once had with God. To be disappointed is to forget Romans 8.28. Disappointments, as someone has said, are 
his appointments. So that's one of the strong points of Satan. That is to say, one of the things that he uses in order to defeat the believer, his strong weapon of disappointment. Secondly, discouragement. That's a little stronger than disappointment. Often disappointment leads to discouragement. And we have suggested here for you to be discouraged is to forget the truth mentioned in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And this is the incidence where uh, during this time David was fleeing from Saul. And you remember, if ever a man had the right to be discouraged, it was David. Remember a little something about his life? He was 17 years old, a shepherd boy, when he was uh, anointed as the king of Israel. And he had to flee from Saul for some 13 years. It was not until David was 30 years old that he finally became king, that God then honored that promise that he had made him some 13 years before, when he was just a lad of 17. And during this time, this 13-year period now, uh, David's life was threatened so many times, uh, not only by Saul, but on this occasion by his own people. I don't mean his hometown of Bethlehem, but he lived in a Philistine city for a while called Ziglag, and on one occasion, they were actually going to stone him because they felt he had done something wrong. And David, we're told, was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man and his sons for his daughters. You see, David uh, wasn't as uh, careful as he should be. And an enemy came in when they were fighting on one occasion in another place and took uh, wives and daughters captive. And David, of course, rescued them later. But the people, the men of the city, were about to stone him because they felt he was a poor leader. But David, we're told, encouraged himself in the Lord his God. To be discouraged is to forget 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And then the third, and this is the ultimate, I think, of disappointment. The first step is disappointment. The second step is discouragement. And then the third step here is despair. And to despair is to forget 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. And if ever a man had the right to be despaired, it uh, was the Apostle Paul. And he writes this, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. I may have on another tape told you the story of Martin Luther and how during the Protestant Reformation things were going badly for him. In fact, some of the German religious leaders that had promised him, the Protestants, they said, if you'll pull out and take a stand against the Pope, we'll be back of you. Well, when he did that, he soon found they were so far in back of him that he couldn't even see them. And the Pope made a threat on his life, and, and he married a very godly uh, ex-nun. I believe, I'm not sure, I believe her first name was Catherine, and uh, we're told on one occasion that she came downstairs dressed in black. And well, he was so discouraged, he hadn't even spoken to her in several days. And uh, so he saw her and he said, asked her, he said, woman, he said, where are you going? And she said, Martin, I'm going to a funeral. Oh, he said, who died? And she said, God died. And he exploded with righteous indignation. He said, God died. He said, woman, it's not enough, he said, that I have to fight blasphemy at the hands of the Pope. But now, in my own household, he said, who told you God died? And she said, you did. And he said, I did. She said, yes, Martin. She said, you're the theologian. And she said, you're the one who translates the book of Romans in the common voice of the people she said, and the way you're acting, you know all about God, and the way you're acting the last few days, you're so disappointed, so discouraged, and the ultimate of despair. She said, I was sure that you found out something 
about God that I did not know. I simply assumed by the way you've been acting that God had indeed died and you're lamenting his death. And that's the reason for your despair. And Luther, we're told, uh, knelt and prayed and asked God to forgive him and then turned and asked his wife to forgive him. To despair is to forget 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. And then the fourth deadly D of the 16, the devil, is to doubt. D-O-U-B-T. To doubt is to forget 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, uh, I wouldn't, I think, give a dime for a Christian who had never doubted his salvation. But I wouldn't give a nickel for a Christian who constantly doubts his salvation. Let me explain that. I don't think that for the first year of my salvation, uh, I had the total assurance that I should have had it all, that I was saved. When I got saved, I knew it, no doubt about that, but then shortly after that, I allowed the devil to tempt me with doubts. But even in my doubts, uh, I, uh, I think I was drawn closer to the Lord, so I sort of thank God for those doubts. I think for a while, it's uh, just to be expected that the Christian may doubt his salvation simply because the devil uh, wants to make him miserable and and sometimes when students come to see me and they say, you know, I heard a certain chapel speaker and he said, you know, if you, uh, if you pick your nose, uh, you know, last year you're probably lost. And, and uh, you know, if you uh, think an evil thought and sometimes chapel speakers make stupid statements, frankly, in various schools. And, and that happens everywhere, I guess. Preachers do the same and teachers do the same, too. But, but, but we confuse our people that hear us. And so... Uh, I always ask him, all right, son, now, uh, when did you accept Christ? Let me know when, and so they'll tell me. Did you actually ask him to come in your heart? Yes, I did. Did you mean it when you said it? Yes, I did. All right, then the very fact that you are doubting your salvation sort of leads me to believe that uh, you really are saved. This is one of the strong points uh, to prove to a student he is saved because if I were the devil, uh, one of the last things on earth I would do to an unsaved person would get him to doubt his salvation to worry about it. I would tell him, you're all right, see? And that's how the devil works. To an unsaved person, he says, you're okay, so don't worry about it. But to a saved person, he wants that saved person to doubt his salvation. And the reason being that if he can get a saved man to doubt his salvation, he can drag his soul to hell, but he can make that Christian so miserable that he'll never go out and win another person to Christ. But to doubt is to forget 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. And then the, the fifth deadly D of the devil is that of disbelief. That's stronger than doubt. And to disbelieve is to forget Hebrews 3 verse 12 where the author warns us, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You see, this was the great sin of the Israelis. They disbelieved the word of God, and then they murmured against the word of God. And by the way, notice here, Paul, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, begins this by saying, Take heed, brethren. He's writing to believers. Is it possible for believers to disbelieve God's word? Yes, it is. Now, normally they are not going to disbelieve the virgin birth and not disbelieve the second coming, but they can disbelieve the promises of God. There was a time in my life, and I gave you that testimony when we went through the life of Elijah, when I not only doubted, but I actually disbelieved portions of the Word of God. I, was, I allowed Satan to take victory on the, over this. And, for example, the passage that says, I will be with you always, and the passage that says that um, 
uh, your fruit shall not return. You know, I've sent you, and your fruit will not return uh, uh, void, and, and I'll give you an increase, and I'm going to use you in all these other precious verses I had once claimed in the ministry. Then I began to disbelieve the Word of God. So to disbelieve is to forget Hebrews 3, verse 12. Then distraction. And that is so prevalent to be distracted, to be to major in the minors or to minor in the majors. Let me make a statement. Now, you may think it's a strange statement, but I uh, would assure you I can prove it. Often the, the great enemy of the best is not the worst, but it's the good. Let me go back and say that again. That the real enemy of the best is not the worst, but it's the good. Simply to be distracted. For example, um, a lot of believers, uh, talking to pastors here now, and pastors, you'll agree with me, will probably not show up in your churches, various churches across America, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Well, let's just say Sunday night. They'll come Sunday morning, but they won't come Sunday night. Now, what will keep them home? That's the best. The best is they should be in service on Sunday night, right? What will keep them home? Do you think uh, they'll stay home because they went out in the afternoon and got drunk? Or do you think they'll stay home because, well, Sunday night is a pastor's our night to attend the local communist meeting, and we're secret card-carrying communists, and we have to attend that meeting, or something like that, or it's my night to rob the local filling station. Now, that's the worst, you see, join the Communist Party or, uh, you know, robbing a bank or getting drunk. But do you think that will be the reason why members will be missing from Thomas Road Baptist Church this coming Sunday night and from your church? No. It won't be the worst that will keep them from the best. It might be something good. Well, you know, I couldn't come because uh, I was tired and I needed to sleep. I have a hard day uh, ahead of me Monday. Now, when a person is tired, it's good to sleep. Or they might say, uh, you know, my kids needed the time to do their homework. And children should get their homework done. That's good. But you see, that's also distraction. And the enemy of the best is often not the worst. But it is simply what I've been speaking about here now, the good. To be distracted is not to deny the Word of God, but it's the same thing. The results are the same. To be distracted is to forget Matthew 14, verse 30. Simon Peter here beckons, um, or the Lord Jesus beckons Simon Peter to walk on the water. And so he walks on the water and he looks down and he sees... Uh, the water and the Bible says, When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the Apostle Paul here, again, whoever is the author of this book, uh, uses the analogy of, the, of a race in order to depict the Christian life. And he says here, I said Hebrews 11, I meant Hebrews 12. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, spectators, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. You see, that's the secret of successfully running and winning the race, to look to Jesus, to be distracted, whether it's for a good thing or a bad thing, is to lose the race. To be distracted is to forget Matthew 14, verse 30. And then double-mindedness. To be double-minded is to forget James 1, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A lot of these tapes are being made during the 
1976 presidential race between Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. Uh, at this, the making of this tape, uh, the election returns are not in, and so you'll be able to, uh, of course, uh, know who won. You'll know who won the race when you hear this tape being played back. But one of the issues that Jimmy Carter was confronted with is his supposed uh, uh, inability to make a straight statement, his uh, uh, being able to flip-flop on an issue, go back and forth, whether it's true or not, it will probably cost him votes. And many believers are that way. They will not take a stand on issues they know to be wrong, and they're like the politician that uh, was confronted with a very heated issue and uh, he knew if he said yes, he came out for it, he'd lose votes. He knew if he said no, he'd lose an equal amount of votes. So here's what he said. He said, friends, he said, I know this issue is a hot one. And he said, let me just say, many of my best friends, many of my closest friends are absolutely opposed to this issue. And he said, also, many of some of the closest friends that I have are 100% behind this issue, for it. And he said, I want to make my position very clear. There'll be no misunderstanding. I'm for my friends. See, he took no stand whatsoever. Double-mindedness. To be double-minded is to forget James 1, verse 8. You see, the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. There are some who speak the truth, but they don't do it in love. And they're so hateful when they do it. But there are some that speak in love and won't speak the truth. Just anything goes. Now, God wants the believer to be uh, single-minded. Paul says, this one thing I do and not to be double-minded, to speak the truth, but to do it in love. All right, dishonesty. And oh, what a deadly D this is. To be dishonest is to be defeated by the devil, and it is to forget 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced, Paul says, the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. How many dishonest believers there are. Believers that will cheat on their income tax. Believers that on occasion will cheat on their spouse. Believers that cannot be trusted to be dishonest is to be defeated by the devil and it is to forget 2 Corinthians 4. By the way, this passage is to pastors where it speaks of handling the word of God deceitfully. A lot of dishonest pastors, I mean, they may be saved, but they won't study and they won't prepare and they won't uh, meditate upon the Word of God, and they get up and they say, I have a message from God, and they just spout it out. They're dishonest, and they're handling the Word of God dishonestly. And then number nine, deceit. To be deceitful is to forget Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I'm 44 years of age, and at times I think I know more about my wife, uh, of whom I have had the privilege of being married to some 15 years, and I think I know more about my son, who's now 13 years of age, than I know about myself. And I know that my heart, among probably above everything else, is deceitful. And the Bible says it is not in the way of man 
to know himself. So, to be deceived is to forget Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And when we deceive ourselves, this is the worst kind of deception, by the way. It's a bad thing to deceive one's husband or wife or children or one's uh, contemporaries. But when one deceives himself, that's the saddest of all. And that's to be utterly, totally defeated by the devil. Number 10 here on the list, dullness. To suffer dullness is to forget Hebrews 5, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull and hearing. The author of the book of Hebrew go, Hebrews goes on to say that, that you ought to be teachers, but you're dull. You're not very sharp. You don't know the Word of God. And you know, pastors will agree with this. There are men and women in your church that have been members of your church for many years. And you're desperately in need of a Sunday school teacher, someone to run as a deacon or act as a trustee. You can't ask these people, though, because they're dull, they're spiritual ignoramuses, and they're defeated by the devil. To be dull is to forget Hebrews 5, verse 11. Now let's take just one more here, deadness. And that's the result, the ultimate result of dullness, of course, deadness. To be dead or to suffer deadness is to forget Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. To be dead is to forget Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. There's a little poem that says, When you get to heaven, you will likely view folks up there whose presence will be a shock to you, but keep it very quiet. Do not even stare. For there will no doubt be many folks surprised to see you there. Uh, I said that to say this. Did you ever see a, uh, well, you thought it was a mannequin in a store, a departmental window in a store, and uh, suddenly uh, the mannequin moved and you realized it was a human being? Uh, when I visited uh, Madame, I think, uh, uh, Toussaint is how that's pronounced. I'm not sure. It's been a number of years ago. It's a wax museum in uh, Canada. And I noticed uh, these figures, and uh, they were so real uh, lifelike that you expect them to just to walk uh, away. But there were several there that, uh, that were human beings, and they were planted there by the management to fool the tourists. And, and so I uh, walked up and one and looked at it, and I said, you know, look at that one. That's... Uh, that uh, really, uh, uh, she didn't do a very good job on this one because uh, it doesn't look very real. Well, then it moved. It was a real person. It embarrassed me to no end. But what I'm saying is that some people are look so dead. You wouldn't think that they had the life of Christ at all within them. And, and when we get to heaven, it's a good thing that uh, we're not going to have to determine who goes there because I know there are some that I, as far as I'm concerned, they're mannequins. They've never been born again. They're wax figures. And uh, when they apply for citizenship in heaven, if I were doing the checking out up there, I would say, oh, no, there's been no evidence whatsoever. You're dead as far as I can determine. You've never been saved because of your deadness. And uh, the Spirit of God would have to say, no, no, Wilmington, let that person in. I know they didn't look like a Christian or talk like a Christian. or A lot of them didn't even walk like a Christian, but they're saved. To be dead is to forget Hebrews 9, verse 14. With this, we'll end the seventh tape and conclude the final tape of this series, tape number eight, at the next lecture.